I think we should be more prone to humanistic use of technology. Let's say, so basically putting the interest of the human in front of anything that you do mm -hmm. and look for types of technologies that are really of a humanistic nature in terms of respecting individual or the respecting the interests of the individual that there are going to be basically interacting with that technology in what way or another. Welcome to Connected FM, a podcast connecting you to the latest insights, tools, and resources to help you succeed in facility management. This podcast is brought to you by IFMA, the leading professional association for facility managers. If you are ready to grow your network and advance in your career, go to ifma.org to get started. In today's episode, Ted Ritter, the head of global IT community for IFMA, is joined by Eric Jaspers and Jean-Pierre Seegers. Together, they converse on topics such as the interconnected nature of emerging technologies, AI and the metaverse, aligning technology with business goals, the affordability of advanced technologies, and more. Now, let's get into it. Job searching doesn't have to be time consuming. With the right resources, you can save time and increase your exposure among leading employers eager to hire. IFMA's JobNet allows employers to search for potential candidates and view their resumes while protecting the job seeker's privacy. Your contact information will only be provided to those you allow, eliminating the chance of receiving unsolicited emails and phone calls. Find your future career on jobnet.ifma.org. My name is Ted Ritter. I head up the global IT community for IFMO. And we're going to have a conversation about technology. And I'm uh, very happy to be joined by my colleagues, Eric Jaspers. Would you tell a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Eric Jaspers, as stated. <laughs> uh, I work with a company called Baum. We produce uh, IWMS type of software. And apart from that, I'm part of the uh, IFMA EMEA board for IFMA itself. Job -tier. I'm Jean-Pierre Segers. I'm from Belgium. I'm affiliated with the Procos Group from Antwerp, Belgium. I'm a university professor, but I'm also a certified facilitator of training for IFMA EMEA. And I have the credentials of FMP and SFP mm -hmm. recently. So I'm Welcome. open for learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Welcome and thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoy our conversation today. So FM technology, you know, what, what, what's going on? We just had this one session where we were talking a lot about cybersecurity, but Jean-Pierre, where do you think the, the most important focus should be for our community and our profession when it comes to technology? Mm -hmm. That's a, a really topical question. What I do when I teach, I teach PhD students in Riga, in Latvia, mm -hmm. at the university there. And one of my subjects is emerging technologies. And I always start with the introduction that all technologies are now a cocktail of technologies. So mm. technologies are interconnected. Mm -hmm. So you talk about uh, the very topical thing today, artificial intelligence, not only chat GPT, but every other aspect that is still emerging in artificial intelligence, but that connects with metaverse, of course. Mm -hmm. So I would think about a metaverse for facility management. Mm -hmm. It's developing. Huh? Interesting. Uh, VR, AR, you name it, all connected. So the facility management industry would have a huge interest in looking into how the connectivity can be made with the core of facility management, in my opinion, and with the built environment for, of course. Excellent. Right. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts, you know, where do you see? The yeah, most, I, where our focus should be. Yeah, I love the, the notion of the interconnectivity of technologies, of course. And I think it's even playing into making this scenery of IT, I, OT, IT even more difficult and complex to comprehend mm -hmm. and basically map out as a facility manager uh, or real estate uh, manager or director, whatever. So basically, Typically, I, do, I take a step back mm -hmm. and I say, well, take a step back and look at your field of operations, the company you work for, the country you work in, for instance, 
And what are the problems, the challenges that you have to meet now, for instance, in Europe, which is slightly different from the US, I would say, mm -hmm. we have this drive to the Green Deal, which is of course a big topic for mm -hmm. facility management. And so basically first try to express the type of action you need to take in order to become compliant or whatever, what the company or the organization is expecting from you. And then uh, just then go look for the technologies that mm -hmm. might help you in doing it. Otherwise the thing is, yeah, you should use AI. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Let's use uh, AI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no for way. what actually, yeah. you know, and that's a really a pitfall. Because in many cases, then you go astray in your projects and you come to a kind of mm. situation that you spent some money, but mm -hmm. you really didn't get anywhere, did you? Yeah. If I may add, I would say that technology is just a means for your core business. It will help develop your core business and, and take it a step further. And what you say about the European Green Deal, very important for us, think also about the Inflation Reduction Act in mm -hmm. the United States, which is the counterpart in the United States, I would add the EU skills and gender. Yeah. Because if you talk about, we heard earlier on someone talking about human resources at the opening keynote, the new generations that are coming into the playing field, mm -hmm. generation Z and the next generation. Those will be very uh, open to new technologies, but they will also have to develop other skills. Yeah. Hard skills, soft skills, social yes. skills. So there again, interconnectivity, it comes, it's, it's one of the focal words in, in my opinion for, for everything that we do, it yeah. all comes together there. What struck me when you said, well, technology is actually a means to an end. Uh, and I think to a certain part that's true, but it's also, it's also a force of a fundamental change. So it's also when it's being introduced, it's going to fundamentally change mm -hmm. other things. So. Years ago, when I was at school myself, I, I recall it was of Professor Hammer and Champy. You had business process redesign. It's a book. Mm -hmm. And basically it was written, uh, it was, I think they were Harvard professors and they wrote it at the beginning when business applications really came to the market mm -hmm. and their statement, the statement of that book was you're going to now to adapt, adopt technology. So you have to fundamentally revisit the way you do business and where you, the way you run your processes and you should do it top down mm -hmm. completely, do mm -hmm. it completely rewrite. Don't take anything for granted what you mm -hmm. do today. To a certain extent, I still believe it's true today by introductions of new technologies mm -hmm. and not just to facilitate that the things that we're doing today. But just imagine the new ways that we can go when we adopt them. Yeah. The central point for me is what's the problem to solve? Yeah, of course. You know? I agree. Yeah. And think also about technology adoption, the, the technology adoption cycle, uh, early mm -hmm. adopter, like the behind. So they're also yeah. in everything that is happening yeah. currently yeah. Yeah, and sure. will happen. Yeah. So I want to be a little bit controversial. I know we're supposed to talk about future trends and you know, we've got all this cool stuff. We've got AI coming and we've got all this interconnectivity, but a lot of what we hear and conversations we're having in the United States right now in Canada and very much Latin America is we can't afford that. So what I'm going to ask both of you is, you know, what basic fundamentals for some of our membership and for the profession when they do not have the budget of a fortune 5,000 company. How, how do you trust it? What do you think, Eric? Well, I don't, to be honest, even if you work at a Fortune 500 company, you might have uh, not enough budget to do what you want to do. <laughs> it is, no, I think, again, it is, when you don't have enough budget for the things that you really feel about, you, need, you should do or must do, um, the question points back to you, yourself. Uh, at first place, did I explain this well enough? Did I make the uh, appropriate argument at the appropriate levels in the organization? Did I really prepare for the case that I'm going to put forward? If I can't have the money this year, there's always a next year. If you didn't prepare that agenda for the next year, you find yourself in the same budget deficit position as you had this year. So uh, I think that's uh, typically also in terms of 
your investment planning as an FM or real estate person. It is first have the vision, the address, and then go execute because you could stay, let's say, here in Europe now under the situation as we're in today under political and geo situation. We saw these rising energy prices. I don't know what your budget is, but if you're going to do something about sustainability in terms of energy, it's going to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. The thing is, if you stop short by saying, okay, well, I just didn't have the budget. Okay. Not, nothing for this year. Yeah, of course you, you won't get there, but you need basically also address your, the, the environmental, mm -hmm. the things in your environment, what are the developments there, what's are what are in next year's threats and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Can I prepare for that to basically able to cope with it better next year. Yeah. So Robert, if there's none of the budget, you know, and you can't afford to make an avatar and, you know, set up virtual training in the yeah. universe, how do we start, you know, from what are the fundamentals yeah. about where do we start? I think Gary has made some very good points. One thing I always also say to my <laughs> students is think about context, local, regional context. Context mm -hmm. can be different between United States and Europe and within Europe, within the United States. There's a difference between Silicon Valley and New York and the Midwest of the US, yeah, for so. example. Yeah. And then the second one would be try looking at uh, good practices, benchmarks, and try to build partnerships, strategic mm -hmm. partnerships, and maybe learn from that. And then zero base, set up your budget towards the goal that you want to achieve with the help of technology or, or by and with technology. Mm -hmm. So a step-by-step -step approach. I think one in, in terms of in our business and technology, sometimes I think we should be more prone to humanistic use of technology, let's say, so basically putting the interest of the human in front of anything that you do mm -hmm. and look for types of technologies that are really of a humanistic nature in terms of respecting individual or the respecting the interests of the individual that there are going to be basically interacting with that technology in what way or, way or another. And I take that to the metaverse. I have very high doubts whether it's going to be helpful for us to be better people, better organizations, have better relationships, because here we get into what's the metaverse versus the building. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know, perhaps you did some research on it. I would be very interested to learn from that, but I seem to have this kind of notion that, well, if we're going to digitize everything we do together, mm -hmm. why would we be together physically mm -hmm. today? You know, I like meeting you with you again since last year. And if it's all going to be virtual, what's left of our lives then? But then you would be talking digital twin. Yeah. But I was at a, just uh, two weeks ago, I was at a keynote uh, on Metaverse by someone who is closely uh, working with yeah, the old Facebook and the current Meta mm -hmm. company. And he presented some, uh, yeah, good practices, benchmarks, key examples of big companies. And one of them was Coca-Cola, which is not a small company as we know. And Coca-Cola has something that is now called Coca-Cola Next Lab. And Next Lab is in the metaverse and they are doing, you know, Coca-Cola is a marketing machine. They are doing a new kind of marketing and even nudging by using metaverse hmm. and also by including things like if we talk sustainable development goals, for example, there is a sustainable development goal that is mm -hmm. on diversity and inclusion and equality. Mm -hmm. And they align that with what they are doing in Coca-Cola next lab. So here the metaverse in this example is an add on to what Coca-Cola is already doing or has already been doing for decades. So uh, what I'm saying is that metaverse can also be an add on and should not replace. And I agree with Eric should not replace what we as humans mm -hmm. are doing and hopefully will still be doing yeah. in the, in the coming, uh, eras. You just made me think of something. Are we going to end up with a second digital divide between the developed countries and underdeveloped countries between the adoption of 
you know, some of these technologies we've been talking about and specifically the metaverse. I mean, yeah, I, I think you have a point. Yeah. It could be a societal division, but also uh, a division between developed and underdeveloped. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the societal division is even more risky. But also in terms of income, we are talking about budgets. That keynote that I was talking about a few moments ago, one of the things was that you would need to buy the, the special uh, appliances, the Oculus, for example, that is being developed, Meta is developing, Apple is developing, Microsoft, okay. Google, you name them, okay. all the big hotshot companies, tech and big tech companies are developing that. Mm -hmm. But who has the buying power for that? Exactly. The companies normally have buy, buying power budgets, but not all companies. There's a difference between a small, a medium sized or a big company. And then if you go to, to, to us as individuals, yeah, not everyone has that buying power. So no. to be aligned with what is happening again. Which is a great point actually, because what I think is massively interesting is not so much you have the application. So let's say you do metaverse. So Facebook is providing me with metaverse for free. When I would be a professional in FM and looking at its adoption, my question would be what, in what business model, model am I entering here? instead of paying a license for each user and basically having another distribution model because money has to be made here, mm -hmm. money has to be made here. So how are they making money there? And is that in line with the interests of my organization? Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of, in the world of FM and real estate, we don't think about that too enough. We just look at the technology and the application. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. I want to have it. Yeah. And, yeah. and don't think the, what's the earning of the supplier and when it's for free, it's even better because you don't need a budget. And if I may, I would compare that to a Pavlovic state of mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you see something and the dog starts to, yeah, give me the food. <laughs> I need that one. So that's Pavlov. It's Pavlov. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's, but it's a fundamental question. So. What do you think we should be concerned about versus happy about with adopting artificial intelligence? Yeah, I've been subscribing to Sh Shed GPT real quickly and mm -hmm. trying it out. And um, I found out, yeah, first insights were, wow, fantastic, this really works. Mm -hmm. Second insight was, oh, there are mistakes in there. Third insight would be, what about privacy? Where are all the things, yeah. We don't have privacy anymore. We put everything we have into, mm -hmm. into the open air, but here it, it becomes really an issue and ethics. So these are concerns that we really need to look at. And for example, Eric knows this even better than I do, I suppose. The European Union is currently looking into, mm -hmm. yeah, you have the GDPR already, but you have like ethical regulations that are being put mm -hmm. into place that is different from what is happening. In the United States, I, I know that uh, you have in your, in your state of law, you have different approaches to, 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 to those things. But what about China, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you have three commercial blocks in the world, <laughs> United States, China, European Union. Yes. So these are real issues to mm -hmm. have a look at in the coming years. There's no, there's other elements to this as well, because these chat GPT, this machine learning is of course based on data sets, learning a neural model, mm -hmm. and basically having the resp and the result of that is that the neural model will respond in a certain fashion. Mm -hmm. So it's what's in the data will be in the response. So if there's prejudice there, the response will show mm -hmm. prejudice at the same time. And, and so I to just finish that. Do we know what data sets are in there? So can we basically judge? The, uh, the the response to what we're getting <clears throat> that's one second the nature of uh, of these models of these neural models is you can't express their algorithm so there's this movement in ai mm -hmm. explanatory ai which will explain the thinking behind the answer mm -hmm. we're not there yet yeah. of course so basically you're in the dark today mm -hmm. because you don't know the data set 
and you don't know the algorithm or the decision-making uh, process behind it. To me, for facility management, that would, for instance, I would be driven to thinking like, don't do it at the workplace, but use it on your physical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, because learning uh, about building operations in terms mm -hmm. of HVAC is, of course, it's a number game. Mm -hmm. But basically having a, a, an AI tell you about how to better put your workplace together because people would be more happy, that's tricky today. Mm -hmm. Really tricky. <laughs> I would never go there today. At least it, will, it will be a learning experience. I'm a big believer of open innovation. Me too. And, and open innovation, I also teach it, but uh, not just because of teaching it. I'm a big believer of that. I've published on it also, but what I want to say is that open AI as a company originating back to Elon Musk, as you will know, mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk is everywhere and on Twitter also, uh, <laughs> but it's a good thing that the open innovation thing is behind the scenes yeah. is there. So that's a good one. And the second one, yeah, you already said it, both of us, it's, it will be a step-by-step -step learning experience. Deep learning means that you only get out of it what is put into it. Mm -hmm. And there the ethical issues will come and surface. Yeah. So it would be looking into the future. You would have these two chatbots. One was created in mm -hmm. China and one was created in the yeah. US. Yeah. You asked them the same question. You got different answers. Yeah. <laughs> but in the, in the communist system. China will never have an open AI mm -hmm. or will never have a chat GPT because in their mindset, this, this is it prohibited might. by law. So mm -hmm. it might it, even be a the, stronger tool it, yeah. if it gives yeah. the right answers. If, if it is feeded by them, yes. of course. Yeah. That's what yeah. I mean. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's, when you, and then it could be basically yeah. everywhere, yeah. you know, and that's even yeah. more of a threat. There was recently a nice case in, in the U.S. where there was an artificial lawyer put into place proposed to do rulings in New York on court cases of street violations, road violations. Mm -hmm. But then the, let's say the, all the lawyer representatives, they opposed it and it was, it was put to a stop. So that's a recent case in New York, as I read somewhere. So, so I know we're about a time, uh, I mm -hmm. thought I'd share one thing, get your feedback on both and how to uh, apply an actual thing, an example of the metaverse practical that just happened last month. So not Europe, not the United States, Colombia authorized the use of the metaverse for traffic court. For traffic court, you got a speeding ticket, you're going to court, but you can put on your glasses and the judges. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it, this is very real. Okay. So the country of Colombia, specifically the prefecture of Bogota, yeah. said, let's try using the metaverse to look, mm -hmm. you know, we have all this traffic get confession. You know, let's see if it works. So you can look it up on YouTube, but just conceptually, mm -hmm. the idea of going to court, something legal. Yeah. Uh, That's just like the uh, New York the, example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you see how we could use that in certain aspects of FM? Yeah. The, the simple example of, uh, looking at new facilities, mm -hmm. how they are being built and how the sustainability aspects of the building okay. would look like. That you can do that in a metaverse environment, I suppose, and, 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 and get insights in, let's say a possibility, a possibility, B poss okay. possibility, C compare that draw, but Eric is looking a bit doubtful. Uh, think, <laughs> no, <sure. laughs> we're, look, we're looking for an application, the technology <laughs> instead of addressing a problem. <laughs> but the thing is to your point, you might do that, but in my mind, the media plays. Okay, does the invest match up to the problem solved? And because it's very easy to talk about, oh, okay, I can do this and that, but you have to put things in place that mm -hmm. they will operate continuously, yeah. improve in continuously, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? We're both in the IWMS world. If the clients don't upgrade on a mm -hmm. yearly, at least a yearly basis, mm -hmm. they are they're running fast into enormous problems. You do the same with your clients. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to stash all that technology more and more in there, but you need to basically serve it and basically update it mm -hmm. on a monthly basis, which is a cost. You started with, I don't have a budget. <laughs> I say, when you look at the technology, does it pay out today? 
might be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's commercialized or whatever. Today, and no. what if you bring business continuity into the big framework? Well, yeah, th that's but yeah, the interesting part of that. That's <laughs> then you I'm go asking questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, I think I like the question because that's insurance, and you pay an insurance fee for a certain. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, factor. The question will be: Will you live up to your promise in terms of guarding me? And that's something again, of course. Yeah. But I think, yes, to that point, that's a half financial. Yeah. Hmm? Jean-Pierre, Eric, thanks so much for joining us today. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And as always, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast for more incredible content.